Yeah, we'll talk about uh, using string diagrams to reason about quantum optics. And this is based on joint work with Bob uh, that you can find at this link. So the starting point of this work uh, is a paper in 2001 from Neil Laflamme and Milborn, where they showed that there's three simple ingredients that you can fabricate in photonics and that allow you to do universal quantum computing. So these ingredients are photon sources. Can you stand the microphone a little Yeah. So these ingredients are photon sources, linear optical circuits. So normally you will have sources that generate photons. They get inside uh, some uh, circuits of linear optics. Linear in the sense that there's only linear interactions between the photons. So these are basically interferometers. The photons only interfere. And, and at the end, you will observe where they come out from these circuits. And this is usually done by taking a fiber cable and plugging it into a, a fridge at zero Kelvin, where there's electricity flowing. And then the photon arrives, and, and the physicist sees a spike in his, uh, in his computer, which tells it uh, the photon has arrived. So uh, these three ingredients would be enough to do universal quantum computing. So if this. Uh, works, if the scheme by Nila Flamme movement works, we should be able to compile any high-level specification of a quantum algorithm onto a photonic circuit. And so this is the main aim of this talk, compiling quantum circuits into photonic hardware. But really, we're going to do something a bit more uh, general. Uh, we're going to map ZX diagrams into photonics. and. Uh, I think most of you know about the ZX calculus in this, uh, in this conference. And you know that there's a back and forth translation between quantum circuits and ZX diagrams. And so you can take, um, and also this back and forth translation is used uh, to optimally uh, compile quantum circuits onto the current hardware. For instance, on IBM devices, Ticket, in order to compile a quantum circuit, would use some rewrite strategies from the ZX calculus to simplify the circuit as much as possible before you actually implement it on a computer. So this kind of, we skip this step, we go directly from the ZS calculus to photonics. And another advantage of, of working with the ZS calculus here is that it has a very strong uh, relationship with uh, measurement-based quantum computing. And uh, so it's going to, and it, it uh, yeah, photonic computing is, uh, it turns out that it's well understood from a measurement-based perspective. And you, you can think of doing photonic quantum computing with, as a measurement-based computation. And so I, I think th this is what we want to do. Okay? We want to go from ZX to photonics. So before we can do this, we need to understand what this uh, photonic hardware does. And, uh, and yeah, so the main kind of aim of this work, with the, the main uh, things that we did was to uh, you, uh, kind of bridge between the quantum optics theory literature, which is uh, in a language which I guess for m many of us would not be so understandable, to bridge this language into the categorical quantum mechanics framework and uh, diagrammatic languages. So I'm going to start by introducing linear optical circuits. Then I'm going to talk about how to quantize uh, the semantics of these circuits. And then uh, this will give us a graphical language to reason about optics. And I'm going to uh, uh, use it to, to see how you can do quantum computing with it. And I'm going to talk about some future work directions because there's still a lot of uh, things to do. So this is all quite preliminary. OK, so, so at the starting point, so in, in, uh, in the optics lab, the simplest ingredients that you can use are beam splitters and phase shifts which we depict like this. And these are interpreted as matrices. So for instance, the beam splitter, it goes from two modes to two modes. So it corresponds to a two by two matrix, which is there. And similarly, the phase shift goes from one mode to one mode. So it's a one by one matrix. And if you build circuits from these components, you can compose them in, uh, in sequence and in parallel. You're going to form bigger and bigger matrices. And whenever you put two, uh, two of these diagrams in parallel, the corresponding matrices 
uh, you take the direct sum. Okay? Uh, so this is like taking a block diagonal matrix. And so here is an example of a composition. This is a max sender interferometer. It's composed of two beam splitters and two phase shifts. And it has this corresponding matrix, which you can compute. So these max sender interferometers are very useful in practice because you can use them to build universal interferometers. So you can uh, put them in these arrays. So each of these boxes would correspond to a max sender interferometer and has two parameters, two phases. And you can show that these circuits parameterize any possible unitary map on, on that number of modes. So another way of saying this is that for any unitary U, that is M by M, there is a circuit on M modes that implements the unitary. Uh, so importantly, uh, I guess I didn't put it here, but uh, you can use this, this classical interpretation as matrices uh, to compute the classical statistics of linear optical circuits. So uh, you can use just this matrix to predict what is going to be the possibility of, say, a beam of, if you input a cohere, uh, sorry, an incoherent beam of light from here uh, with some intensity, you want to know what's the, prob what's the intensity output of this port and what's the intensity at, at that port. And in order to compute this, you just take the absolute value squared of the entries in the matrix. So this would be the one, one entry. So you take this absolute value squared. It gives you the probability that a photon entering here outputs here. Um, OK, so in order to reason about these optical circuits, we're going to decompose, uh, decompose them into some simpler components. Uh, so this is basically opening up the, and if you look, uh, these are the matrix entries. And we are using these two components, the split and the merge. So these components, together with uh, swaps, unit, co-unit, and, uh, and endomorphisms, they form a, ca um, a calculus, another, a new calculus, the, that I'm going to call the path calculus, which, again, has an interpretation in matrices with the byproduct as smaller simpler matrices, and when you compose them like this, you get back the matrices for linear optics, for instance. And you can reason about these diagrams with rewrite rules that equate different diagrams. And all the axioms of the path calculus are in this slide. So on the left, you have uh, the axioms that say that the, the merge and the split form a each one is a monoid, the other is a comonoid, and they, form a, and they interact as a bi-algebra. And on the left, you have the axioms for the endomorphisms, uh, which uh, have an additive and a multiplicative structure, making them a semi-ring. So these are all the axioms you need uh, to reason with these path diagrams. And you can say this formally by saying that the axioms that I've just shown are complete for the category of matrices with byproduct. So this means that for any equality between matrices, you can prove it using these axioms. And the proof is actually super simple because this is uh, yeah, a very simple language. Uh, you, you can start from any diagram, and you reduce it to a normal form, which looks like a weighted bipartite graph, where you've used the bialgebra law repeatedly to put all the comonoids on one side and all the monoids on the other. And in the middle, you're going to have weights for every connection. And these weights are basically given by multiplying the weights of paths from, so here, for instance, I'm, I'm putting black is the value 2, because there's two paths, for instance, from here to here. Um, OK. So this I've already said about the classical probabilities. And so yeah, we, want to, we have this basic um, calculus to reason about matrices, and that we can implement in an optical lab, and we can uh, compute the entries in these matrices. So uh, what we want is to be able to predict what's going to happen when we put inside this, uh, these chips. We don't put just uh, a single beam of incoherent light, but we put, or a single photon, but we put multiple photons inside the chip. So in order to represent the state space of multiple photons in a chip, uh, we're going to use the bosonic Fox space. So this is defined by uh, taking uh, an infinite direct sum over all the i's. i's would be the number of particles 
uh, in the state, in the system. And at every level in this, uh, in this byproduct, we take the, the tensor product of the starting vector space H with itself I times, but we take the tensor product symmetrized. So in the sense that we equate between uh, two states if we can just swap to get from one to the other. And uh, so if you look at the nth component in this direct sum, uh, this is the tensor product of H with itself and times symmetrized. And it's isomorphic to the free vector space over some basis um, elements, which are given by the number of ways of putting n modes in m possible positions. So here m is the dimension of the Hilbert space. So if you start from a chip with m modes, the, Hilbert, the starting vector space h would be c to the m, an m-dimensional vector space. And the state of multiple photons in this, in this, uh, uh, in, in this chip is going to be given by this bo bosonic Fox space. So uh, here I've defined the bosonic Fox space on vector spaces, on, so on objects of the category. But this can be extended to a functor on the, on, on the full category. So it, in order to define a functor, we need to define it on object, and that's what we've done. But we also need to define it on arrows. So for a matrix A that goes from M to K wires, so an M by K matrix, we're going to define the nth uh, component. Uh, we're going to take the direct sum over all the n's of Bn of A, where Bn of A is defined with respect to this uh, alpha. An alpha dagger here is an isometry. It's, in fact, a natural transformation between two functors. But uh, so this alpha dagger, basically what it does is, you see here we have the tensor product that's uh, symmetrized for A, so in this in here, while well, here it's uh, not symmetrized. So this alpha is basically taking an indistinguishable state of photons, so a state of n photons in m modes, and mapping it to all the possible orderings of these photons, all the ways of making them distinguishable. There's exponentially ban many of them. So you go into the superposition of exponentially many terms, and then at each of these, uh, on each of these systems, you apply the, the matrix alpha. So you, you just apply A tensored n times, and then you go back into the, with the dagger. So this was shown by Vickery to form a functor in 2008. And uh, what we've shown is that it recovers the usual definition of the amplitudes of uh, linear optical chips that's given by Aronson and Arkhipov in 2010. And they, the, they showed that the amplitudes are given by taking permanence of a matrix in this way. And in fact, they use this result to prove that, the, uh, that simulating the outcomes of linear optical circuits is a classically hard problem. Because in fact, the permanent is a well-known Sharpie complete problem. And what you're getting here, the amplitude, uh, what you do with the quantum computer is you get an additive approximation of, an amp of the amplitudes. And they show that if a classical computer can get an additive approximation of permanence, uh, then the polynomial hierarchy collapses. So this is a hard problem to do. Uh, so linear optical circuits are solving a hard problem when you put multiple photons inside. OK. So this is kind of to give you the semantics, this kind of concrete semantics. But what we want is a, is a diagrammatic language to reason and program uh, linear optical circuits. So we're going to start by taking the path calculus that we've already defined. And we're going to add these uh, states and effects. So these are basically just states of, uh, that says there's n particles in this mode. And this calculus now doesn't have semantics in matrices with byproduct, because in that category, uh, you only have one, uh, exactly one state and one effect, which are the zero, the empty state and effect. But you can interpret it after taking the bosonic Fox space function. So uh, so you can interpret it in, in the category of Hilbert spaces with tensor product, where the path generators, you just interpret them in matrices, and then you lift them with the bosonic Fox space functor. And this you can map directly in there. And we're going to add just some basic rules to reason with these diagrams. Uh, so here we have like rules to reason with scalars. And these ones, they allow to translate uh, n-particle states into 
and single particle states and they have these normalization coefficients which pop out all the time in optics and um, and yeah so with these simple uh, laws we can reason about optical experiments so an example uh, is the Hong Mandel effect so this says that uh, basically if you have a beam splitter and you put two photons uh, on the beam splitter so you throw two photons at the same time on the beam splitter they have to be really within like a coherence time to uh, exactly at the same time they arrive on the beam splitter uh, what you would expect is either they both go up or they both go down or one goes up one goes down but what happens in practice is that this possibility of them going each their own way uh, cancels out and it's impossible so the photons always bunch together and you can prove this in the q calculus by starting from the diagram which corresponds to so this diagram here corresponds to the event that you start with two photons in the two modes then you apply this is the matrix of the beam splitter and then you post select on there being one photon on the top and one on the on the bottom and you can rewrite this to get these two terms which correspond basically to them being both reflected and being both transmitted and these uh, cancel out and so you get zero probability for this event um, in general uh, when you want to kind of rewrite a, a diagram you start from some q path diagram and you're gonna first rewrite it to a weighted bipartite graph like this so here I didn't put the weights but uh, yeah any q path diagram can be reduced to a weighted bipartite graph in the same way that we've done it for the path calculus and after this we, you can use the branching law and the and the elimination law, the bone law, so this, this, these ones, the scalar ones, um, to show that this actually factors into all the possible, uh, so th the terms are given by all the possible matchings of, uh, perfect matchings of this graph. Um, and there's a nice result in graph theory that says that the uh, sum of weights of perfect matchings of a graph is the same as the permanent of its adjacency matrix. So just this graphical calculus basically mimicking the same process at, at the graphical level. Um, so how do we use this to perform quantum computing? I'm gonna basically, uh, well, first we need to encode qubits in, in optical circuits and then we need to uh, show how all the different qubit operations can be mapped onto the photonics. So we're gonna use this dual rail encoding which so if you start from a qubit which I'm gonna uh, say has states H and V I can encode it into two optical modes where there is one photon and if it's on the bottom then it's H and if it's on the top it's V. So this is a, a way of drawing it. So it, this, here I'm using the ZX generators and the ZX calculus and mapping it um, in this way. So you can also map all single qubit unitaries on to, uh, uh, with this dual rail encoding. So for instance the Hadamard matrix becomes a beam splitter which is a different version than the one we've seen before where you have a minus one here. Uh, so here I'm using this color code where blue edges correspond to an edge with a minus one and red edges correspond to an edge with an eye and I'm also not c taking care of the of the normalization factors um, so but this tells you how to map Hadamard gates uh, and uh, green phases so all single qubit unitaries into path diagrams or into optics and we get a new new versions of the Hong Mandel effect which kind of look nice with these uh, with these colors because uh, you have uh, that uh, this diagram which is symmetric with red edges is zero and this one if it's asymmetric with a blue edge it's uh, it's zero as well and this we're gonna use uh, in two seconds but um, so we've we've done single qubit unitaries any single qubit things we can we know how to map and now we need entangling uh, processes and instead of like mapping circuits again we're starting from just zx diagrams so this basically here is a is a projective measurement a non-destructive measurement which uh, takes um, which corresponds to the linear maps that sends hh to h and vv to v and it 
can be encoded as this diagram, which basically is checking that in these two modes there is exactly one photon, and this is only satisfied by the states HH and VV. Um, so we have this ingredient that's going to be useful, and then we have we also know how to map the Bell state. Um, so this is uh, just you can kind of engineer it, but the way to see that this is the Bell state is to basically it reduces to all these different terms depending on the outcomes that you want to see. So having two photons on the f left means that they didn't go inside. So here it cancels out and it leaves you with this sub diagram of the initial diagram. And then you can just check uh, to see that uh, most of these terms cancel out. So all the symmetric uh, diagrams, they cancel and they're zero. And the only things left are HH and VV here. So here you're regenerating really the Bell state. And note that you're using post-selections. So this is uh, one of the critical features of, of this uh, scheme is that it uses post-selection. Uh, but when you, there are ways of generating the Bell state with bigger and bigger QPath diagram that use more and more ancillary photons, post-selecting on more ancillary photons. And actually, the probability of success of the protocol increases. And that's the trick that makes it possible to do universal quantum computing with this. So I was telling you, right, we need to map all of ZX into it. So here are the generators, and we've mapped all of them except for the split. But this can be obtained with a cup by bending a wire of a thing. And so you see that just from the basic things that we've seen, you can keep building bigger and bigger cluster states into as photonic circuits by post-selecting certain uh, outcomes. Yeah, so. Um, for future directions, there, there are many directions. So here I've shown you like one encoding of ZX into QPath, but I told you also that there are many other encodings if you use more ancillary photons. So it would be nice to relate between these. So these all give you the same types of processes. So it would be nice to have higher level rewrite rules between QPath diagrams that, for instance, add ancillary qubits. It would be nice to. Uh, to study these uh, colorings of QVAT diagrams. For instance, does the polyfragment correspond to some problem of coloring from graph theory? Um, and uh, it would be nice to get rid of the branching law, because here I'm kind of getting this exponential blow up of terms by using the branching law and decomposing into sums. And it would be nice if we had a calculus that doesn't require sums. And uh, finally, uh, some nice questions on trace. Uh, are also open. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Giovanni. Um, questions? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, thank you um, very much and nice, very nice presentation. Um, so, so I have a, I have one question. So about the that uh, the fourth point about getting rid of the branching law. So, do you have any ideas? Because um, uh, when you are interested, for example, to compute uh, for an input and output uh, with some photons, um, it's a Sharpie problem to compute that, and uh, you have a exp as you said exponential uh, uh, number of terms. And I would just want you to know if you think it's possible, and if you think it's possible, if you have any ideas uh, uh, how to come, uh, how to do that. Yeah, actually, I think it's a good point that probably it could also not even be possible to to get rid of this law because maybe it would have some complexity theoretic uh, consequences that then you can compute the amplitudes in polynomial time. But I still think that maybe not to get a completeness result, but at least to get this reasoning of adding ancillaries, for instance, to your protocols, uh, this definitely should be something that you can reason about at the full di pure diagrammatic level without splitting uh, your diagram into sums, I think. So thanks for the talk. Um, does the Bosonic Fox space construction satisfy some universal properties like the usual Fox space one? Yes. So it's a very nice. So uh, it's a nice question. Uh, so, it, so the Bosonic Fox space functor has been used uh, as a model, for instance, of the exponential modality in linear logic because it sends the b direct sum to the tensor product and. Um, I mean, it's been used in a paper where not much description actually of the details is given. 
uh, and I can point you to this paper. It's a paper by Sili, Panangadan, and uh, some others. Uh, yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. I've got two questions, uh, two related questions on your calculus. The first one is, I was wondering if you, if there's possible with your calculus to construct tensor products in the in the usual sense, in addition to the direct sum. So, for example, if you have a if you have a, like a an interferometer somewhere, so that consists of the direct sums of the two parts, and then you have a another interferometer somewhere else in in space. Um, is it possible to draw both of those interferometers independently? And secondly, I wanted to ask if it's possible to um, to depict different types of degrees of freedom, like uh, internal degrees of freedom, such as polarization of the photons, um, in addition to the uh, spatial modes. Uh, yes, so I, I'll first answer the second question. Um, so for other degrees of freedom, if you're modeling it with, uh, so if the kinds of processes that you act on, uh, so the kinds of processes that you use are linear optics. You can always encode, like for instance, the polarization can be encoded into two spatial modes. So here I'm using the term spatial mode just because it's more intuitive to think about it spatially, but it really there could be any modes of, of, uh, of photons. Um, so in general, like the, this is the base category that you can encode any linear optical process on. And uh, for, the, for the first question, maybe we can discuss a bit uh, more. I'm not sure I understood. So what's, in, what's important is that in the path diagrams, you have the direct sum. So if you just take two linear optical circuits, the, the, first in, the classical interpretation is with direct sum. But as soon as you put multiple photons, now you can really think of the two uh, diagrams that you're tensoring as tensor product of them. This, yeah. OK, thanks. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was wondering if you, you seem to be modeling non-adaptive linear optics, like boson sampling type experiments. But for quantum universal quantum computation, you need adaptivity. So you need to be able to change the interferometer as you do measurements in between. How, how could you incorporate that into a diagrammatic calculus? Do, are you working on this? Um, yes. Yeah, so change the. So uh, yeah, I guess some of the protocols for this use uh, corrections. Uh, and I think that this can be, I mean, I haven't thought about it in much detail because, uh, so th there would be a trivial way of, of encoding it by kind of adding classical uh, information on top of these diagrams. Like you, you get a measurement outcome from your future measurement, you want to use it in some future um, uh, implementation. So that would be one way and um, and yeah, a second way, I think that this, this uh, trace, uh, a trace structure and feedback structure in optics is going to be useful to model these different um, unfoldings in time of the uh, photonic computation. But yeah, I'm up for discussing it later. Hey, thanks, Sarah, for, for the nice talk. I just had a, a question because I'm quite confused. Hey. <laughs> um, so, so there is difference between the Fox space and the, like, the mode space. Um, and it seems, so when you say, for instance, that a, a Hadam gate is just a beam splitter, it's not in the Fox space, right? It's uh, like, well, it works only with one photon, not more than one photon. So how does it relate to the fact that you're dealing with the entire Fox space? Um, yeah, so, I mean, here you can still think of, so in this, when, when you do this, for instance, you're thinking about, you're in a sector of the bosonic Fox space where there's only two photons because you've, your diagram has only two photons and two post-selections. If there's different numbers of preparations and post-selections, the diagram is zero. And, uh, and so you're always in this kind of local setting. And, um, and I mean, the relationship between these two is given like uh, precisely when you add more than one particle, you go in the bosonic Fox space. So yeah, that's what kind of I described here. Um, so you, you would take the H is the space of a single photon, and it's the matrices with direct sum, 
um, and and this one is in the is the space with multiple photons. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, let's thank Giovanni again. Um, so hi everyone. So I'm very glad to be here for my first uh, conference. So I will present you so the Love Calculus, a graphical language for uh, linear optical quantum circuits. So it was a uh, work done uh, with uh, so Alexandre Clément, another PhD student, uh, Simon Perdui, and two uh, two of my PhD supervisors, Shane Masfield and uh, Benoît Valier. Uh, so first, um, I would like to present uh, what I'm planning to explain. Uh, so thank you, Giovanni, for, for your presentation, because uh, maybe uh, I can be quite, uh, quite quick for the first part. So first, I will introduce you to linear optics. And, uh, and then I will try to uh, explain the proof of uh, the completeness of the love calculus, so the graphical language we, 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 uh, we, we have. Uh, and so the second part will be like uh, the step uh, to explain how the proof works. And so the second part will be like a sub-fragment of the language. And, uh, and the third part will be like uh, the, the, the love calculus itself and, uh, and the proof, uh, the sketch of proof for the complete list. So first, uh, let's go to linear uh, optics. So basically, uh, photons is a quanta of the electromagnetic field. And uh, we can encode the information with many degrees of freedom, which uh, which called modes. Uh, so it can be like a frequency, time beams, or polarization, special modes. And in the love calculus, we are interested in two of them, so polarization and uh, special modes. So first, first just explain, uh, maybe illustrate some notation. So for example, polarization, if we have a photon on the wire, uh, let's say we have two polarization, V and H. And uh, for this, when we put, when we have uh, the two degree of freedom polarization in special mode, uh, let's say we have that notation, so VH for, again for polarization, and the index is just the number of wires. So as Giovanni explained, this is a direct sum. Uh, so here we have four wires, but not uh, two up to four modes, but uh, here two times the number of wires because we have uh, two polarization per mode. Okay, and so which, what is cool with the graphical language uh, love calculus, it is basically we use uh, linear optical components of circuits. So it may be a bit ugly, uh, maybe a bit ugly, it is a bit ugly, but <laughs> uh, here's for example a, a circuit, so basically there is a wire with the input here, uh, so wave plate, so we'll introduce that later, but just a linear optical components about polarization. Oh yes, so PBS, uh, polarization beam splitters, that we also introduce that later, and uh, any components. Uh, but here we, we like semantics, so just uh, let's jump to the semantics of the components. Uh, so here it is a wave plate. Uh, so basically, just think of uh, a rotation uh, between the two polarization H and V, so with a parameter uh, angle theta. And uh, the polarization beam splitters, so just remember that uh, for the first, I mean, for both wires, if a photon has a uh, vertical polarization, then it, uh, it uh, reflects, it bounds. So the, the V mode is like the identity. However, if it's H, then it transmits. So the, the photon H1, H0 becomes uh, H1. And uh, so it, the, this, this are both um, linear optical components acting on polarizations. And we have also uh, components acting only on a special mode. So the phase shifters, uh, just adding a phase, basically. And the mist splitters. So again, it's like a, a, um, a rotation, um, but only on the, on the photons with the same polarization. So it's like a rotation between V0 and uh, V1, and uh, H0 and uh, H1. Um, just notice that we have chosen the convention. There is no consensus to choose like uh, the convention of the wave plate or the beam splitters. Uh, sometimes they, uh, those are different matrices. We choose that one because there are two nice properties. First, it is a rotation, and also uh, it is a symmetric uh, matrix. Um, okay. And uh, so we have in the optical components. <coughs> Sorry. And also in uh, in the circuits, uh, we have uh, sources and detectors. Uh, so basically, we can imagine uh, like sources of uh, many photons. Uh, in practice, it's uh, at most one. I mean, we, we have uh, sometimes more photons than one, but it's not what we want, basically. But in that language, we will only be, only be interested in uh, what, I call, what we call zero sources. So basically, we just, uh, we just know that there is no photon in, uh, in the wire at the input. And the second thing is like the detectors. Uh, so again, we can imagine detect uh, some photon. In practice, 
Uh, we can have detectors which, where we know the number of photons that we detect, uh, but we can also have like a click detectors where we only uh, have either zero or at most one photon that we detect. Again, uh, we, um, we are only interested in uh, what we call a zero detector. So it's a bit more interesting than zero sources because it has the semantics, which we call that later, that we post select of having zero photon at the output of the circuit. Uh, so, so what is love? Uh, so love is the prop generated by all the linear optical components, uh, with also um, the zero sources and detectors. So a prop for the, the people who are not very familiar. Just imagine that we can compose our, our, our linear optical circuits horizontally and vertically. Again, it's a sum, and also that we can uh, uh, we can deform the circuit uh, however we want uh, for the swap, etc. And, um, and uh, yes, so that, that's it. And so we have love, but of course we would like to have uh, great uh, properties uh, about love. And so uh, one of them is like the completeness. So given two circuits with the same semantics, we'd like to know if we can rewrite one into the other. To do that, so as I was saying at the beginning, we introduced a sub-fragment um, of so circuits, where what we call a polarization preserving circuits. So basically, we are interesting circuits where the components are only the beam splitters and phase shifters. So only components, we don't change the polarization, uh, hence the name of uh, polarization preserved. And so, yeah, just it's, it's a pro, so like a prop, but without the property of the swaps. Uh, and so what we have, um, uh, what we have uh, with, uh, with that uh, sub-fragment is a rewriting system. Uh, so basically, a set of rules where we rewrite um, the circuits of lab. Uh, so as you can may see, uh, all the rules on the top are quite easy. I mean, uh, it just, uh, for example, psi uh, in uh, good intervals or just propagate some phases. And there are two, uh, maybe, I mean, not maybe, two more difficult uh, rules and uh, maybe more interesting rules uh, where we have uh, angles which are not trivial depending on uh, on the, on the angles of, of the input. So it's quite, uh, we call them uh, LR rules. Uh, so it's basically like also in the, the ZX where we have an equation with uh, some angles which are not, uh, not trivial. And so for that rewriting system, we have proven two things. So the first one, it, uh, first thing we, we, we have proven is like it's strongly normalizing. So basically the rewriting system always terminates to a normal form. And uh, the second thing is we have shown that it is locally confluent. Uh, so for any scheme here, if you, can, uh, if you have, for example, two choices uh, to, to rewrite, like uh, some parts of the circuits, then it always converges to the same uh, at the end. Or we, we, have, we have a path to converge. And so the both properties, so strong normalizing and locally confluent, imply that we have a unique normal forms uh, for the rewriting systems. And so I will show you how the normal forms look like. So among the rules I show you, um, one again, which is uh, interesting, that the uh, early rules, this one, so the 3D, because it is the only uh, rule which is changing the shape of the circuit. Here you can see that we have um, beam splitters, one beam splitter on the bottom, and here one beam splitter at the top, so we basically revert that. And so with that rule, uh, changing the shape, and also other rules like uh, composing when we have, uh, for example, uh, components that we can simplify. Uh, we have that form of the circuit, uh, which is very cool because it is uh, also um, a very uh, well-known form in optics. Uh, it was the uh, first uh, result, like the first universal form of circuit, uh, circuit was uh, triangular. And so, well, I wouldn't say I'm a liar, but I just, as it is a general form, but if we want to be a bit more precise, uh, here we have some properties on the angles. So basically, um, if, for example, alpha 2 is 0, then we have alpha 1, which is 0. So the normal form is not like a perfect triangle, uh, but more like uh, this one on the right, because if we have a 0 somewhere, we have a, a diagonal of zeros, which is, we come from the, the rule. And um, so it may be, well, I couldn't uh, do uh, better than uh, the next slide to show you uh, what's happening with the rewriting rules. So, so at Candela, we have um, a software so named Perceval, and we have coded, uh, implemented the rewriting system. 
So here is um, basically a, oh, a video, which, no. Ah, yes. Um, it's a video where we rewrite uh, the, the circuit. And so we add just uh, added colors because it may be easier uh, to understand. So again, like um, on the left, it's just to, to simplify components. And uh, the railroad's uh, 3D, like the, the green one. So, so it may be a bit fast, but otherwise it would be too long to just to, to wait until the end. So you can see, for example, here are the three bin switchers will be simplified. And each time we have that scheme, uh, it will be rewritten. And so I don't know, but I can advance a little. And at the end, OK. It was better on my just PC or well, whatever. OK, so believe me, but at the end, we have a nice triangle. And uh, I'm very sad that it doesn't work that well. Sorry? Yeah, but it's 40 seconds, and I think I, yeah. <laughs> well, but at the end, you just have a triangle. Well, I think. I will that uh, into the question. I will show you that again. <laughs> uh, and so, <laughs> And so let's come back to love. Um, so here what we have is like uh, the rewriting system with a unique number of and triangular for, um, uh, for circuits with only bin splitters and phase shifters. And we are come, let's come back to love where we uh, have uh, all the components that we uh, introduced earlier. And here uh, are 18 equations. OK, so first, a shortcut, uh, just because it's uh, easier. So it's basically the negation. So we can uh, implement that with a circuit, but we just changing v into h and h to v. And here are uh, 18, uh, 18 equations, which are basically the axiom of the Olaf calculus. Um, and so the, the set of equations is, uh, is sound and complete. So first, so yes, this part is like uh, explaining how that works, the proof works. Uh, first, we can notice two things. The first is uh, that we can derive all the rewriting rules of earlier with uh, the set of equations. So we can see we have, again, uh, the, the wonderful uh, LR rule uh, at the end but also like, uh, for example, composition of phase shifters, etc. So first, we can use all the properties of the re rewriting system of earlier. And the second point, it is like we, we, we will use, of course, uh, the polarizing preservation, uh, preserving fragment in order to have no more forms with, uh, for the love calculus. So OK, so let's, uh, let's uh, explain uh, what's happening. So last thing, I promise, thing I, I will introduce to you is like um, wow, a new element, so this one. So we can just pay, uh, spend a bit of time to understand what it's doing. Imagine if you have a photon on the first wire, uh, so with the polarization V in, uh, in H. So again, V reflects, so on the top, and H transmits. And again, it is a shortcut for the negation, so the H becomes V. So basically, the same. OK. OK. Uh, basically, the semantics of uh, this element is uh, this one. So we split the polarization, and then after, uh, we have uh, the same polarization. Uh, so we are basically translating polarization modes into spatial modes. Uh, of course, we can have the, the dual. If we compose them, we have the, the identity. And uh, so we can see what's happening when we have, for example, a phase shift, uh, phase shifter before. Uh, so remember, a phase shift is doing a phase shift on both H and V here. And so when, if you split into spatial mode, we just basically need to have uh, two phase, phase shifters here. But what, what happens, I mean, what is more interesting, if we have uh, an element with, um, uh, which is acting on the polarization, for example, like a wave plate, so the rotation. So remember, wave plate is a rotation between H and V. But if we separate H and V here, and H become V, so the same, then basically we, we, we can have uh, a bin splitters at the, on the right. And uh, same for the PBS, just like uh, swapping some modes. So on the right, just uh, some swaps. And so here we have translated. We have basically transformed uh, linear optical components acting on polarization into linear optical components only acting on spatial modes. And so maybe some of you uh, can deduce where I'm going. So for example, imagine we have a circuit without zero sources and detectors first. I will introduce uh, the last, the more general form after. But imagine we have that circuit. So C, we can, we can have that component, basically the identity. And then we can pro pro transform any linear optical components uh, acting on polarization or, or not uh, into only uh, bin splitters and phase shifters, so on the right. Then we can use the reacting system on the polarization present environment to have a unique normal form. And so that is the normal form of circuits without any zero and, 
sources and detectors. So here we have a normal form for, um, for that kind of circuit. So now, of course, the question is, what is a normal form for any love circuit? Good question. And so here, basically, if you have two, uh, so th that is basically the normal form of, um, of uh, any uh, love circuit. But, some, but uh, it's not unique. So sometimes T1 is not equal to T2, even if the semantics of uh, C1 and T2 are equal. So however, we can always, as the semantics are equal, we can always write T2 like that. So with uh, some boxes, so T1, we, uh, we produce T1, and um, another, some, um, some circuits, basically it's uh, about injection, etc. but some boxes here. And so we can write T2 into that, T1 and some boxes here. And as it is only zero, detectors and, um, uh, sorry, sources and detectors, we can absorb the boxes into the zero sources and detectors. So basically, that is a normal form of the love calculus. And thanks to that, uh, we, we proved the, the completeness of the language. OK. Um, conclusion. <laughs> so first, um, we have introduced a polarization um, preserving fragment. And in that fragment, we have introduced a rewriting system uh, where we prove two properties, so the um, strongly normalizing uh, property and also the confluence. And uh, I would just p highlight that it is uh, very useful for, um, uh, for the physicist, <laughs> I would say the lab people, uh, because, um, for example, if uh, some circuits, if we have some noise in the phase shifters, in the B splitters, etc., uh, we can uh, use the rewriting rules basically to propagate the, the, the errors and, uh, and also to find maybe, maybe new circuits. Uh, we, which have the same semantics to correct some, uh, some parts. So even that reaction system is useful uh, in that sense. Uh, but also it helps, it helps, uh, helps, helps us to prove uh, the completeness and the soundness of, uh, of the full fragment, so the love calculus, so any linear optical components with zero sources and detectors. And uh, finally, uh, last bonus point, as we have a complete, S, um, a complete set of equations, uh, of uh, love circuits, we can think of love circuits basically as unitary. So even it's like not big unitaries, but still we have a complete set of equations with uh, graphical uh, rules. And we can imagine if we have a unitary, for example, of, ta of size two up to n, is to use these rules, even if it's a big matrix, to, um, to have a graphical set of, of equations working on just the matrices, just forget about the circuits. Uh, and so we, we can use also uh, this set of equations, uh, for example, to prove uh, the completeness of quantum circuits. So basically, we translate uh, the rules of the love calculus into uh, new rules about quantum circuits, just because we have a complete set of equations. And I think it's time to thank you, everyone, for, the, for listening. So, well, Nicola the puts the uh, beautiful video back on up here. Um, are okay. there any questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, confused about the interpretation of the yes. the uh, what is this called? The zero preparation and like detectors. Yeah. Because they're both sent to like the identity scalar how, do, yeah. how does a how can that is it like a monoidal is the interpretation monoidal or like how, how can it send uh, something from like zero to one wires and one to zero wires both to like a scalar okay so uh, I think uh, so so first um, so I will come back to the slide just after that in 10 seconds. But first, uh, the <laughs> uh, no, the, the zero source and zero detectors. So just to interpret that, it just we create a mode. So the, as you say, the, the, the type is uh, zero one for uh, for the source and uh, one zero to, to the detector. And uh, and uh, and it's not a problem. It's, uh, the semantic is a zero because it's the direct sum. So it's uh, we only have a zero on the wire and not on all the full circuits. And I think we you refer to that slide, right? Oh, sorry. Okay, That's some problems again. This one. Um, 
Um, so basically, we are just saying that uh, if uh, so it's not the same type, okay? But uh, we're just saying that semantic is zero. So basically, if you have a wire and a zero detector, it's basically saying we, you, 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 have a, you take the sub matrix, you just uh, post select on the fact you have zero photon on the wire, and uh, same for the source. You have a sub matrix and you just uh, have no, no sign. I don't know if it's answer your question or. on that. Uh, so is this first one actually um, something like a vector with no columns and this is like a vector with no rows and that's just an empty yeah. matrix or something? Is that because this is all additive, right? So it's not an empty matrix. Uh, like, uh, I mean, yes, it is. Sorry. Uh, what is the question? So is it a question or is it a remark? Uh, it was it was a question I was asking to to clarify. So 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 these are all like slightly different kinds of things, but they're all zero, right? Kind of the same conceptually, yes. yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, basically, yeah. yes. Um, other questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, regarding normal forms, so you showed the normal form reduction, which is similar to the REC scheme, this triangular scheme. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you worked on the Clements scheme, the rectangular? And the second question is, can you, can you for either scheme, can you recognize small depth circuits? S small? Depth like circuits ah, yes. that don't have too many beam splitter layers so that you don't need the complete normal form but only a reduced smaller version of it. Okay, so very good remarks. So here uh, the normal form is like triangular and, uh, and uh, so we have a procedure to rewrite into a rectangular so to minimize the depth. However, the procedure is, uh, d doesn't have the, um, the same properties as this one. So we have a procedure to go from the triangular to rectangular so to minimize the depth but it's not uh, it's not strongly normalizing. We don't have a, a rewriting system for that. We just have an algorithm to, to do that. Hi, could you show the, um, the normal forms at the end, please? Uh, slide 16. The last one? Yeah, this. This one? Okay. So what is T1? I didn't quite follow. That's the, the LOPP normal form? Yes. Okay. And so is it uh, possible to find the, this minimal one? Is, there, is that a good question? Uh, so what do you mean minimal? Like with the less number So of to elements? get from T2, I add things to T1. So I'm wondering if there's a smaller T0 oh. that I get by adding things to T1. Uh, um. I would say, uh, I don't know if we can do that de deterministically. Uh, uh, I would say, yeah, w f the, okay, the answer is I don't know. But I would say we can try, because uh, here we have a um, triangular, and we can absorb as many things as we want here. And, uh, and I think we, can, we can't simplify uh, that much. So, so, so I would say yes, but uh, I don't know if it's minimal. Okay, because that's... maybe we have some uh, other things. Okay, one more question since I've got a microphone. What does the V stand for? What is the? V. Oh, yes. Very good question. Uh, so, L, uh, of course, LO uh, are for linear optic, uh, optics. And the V is for vacuum modes because we have uh, only zero sources and detectors. And, of, and also uh, uh, for love because uh, it was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but first for vacuum. <laughs> okay, are there any more? Questions? Ah, uh, yeah, down the front. So, a very basic question. If your parallel composition is the direct sum, does that mean that you only ever have one photon and you're looking at the alternatives for it? Or is there a way you can actually make sense of several photons in this context? Uh, so you're right in the sense that it's actually a single photon semantics, so we are interested in the photon. Uh, I would say it's not that bad because uh, as, it, as, as, as it was shown, we are focusing on the processes. Sorry? Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> um, so yes, it is a single photon semantics. I would say not, it's not that bad because here we are very focusing on the processes and circuits. Uh, and so yes, of course, one, uh, one, uh, one future work would be to add uh, more photons to the semantics. And, uh, okay, thank you.
Okay, uh, let's uh, thank Nicola again. Okay, thank you very much. So first I want to thank the organizers for this nice, uh, nice conference. Thank you. So, uh, so today I want to talk about, uh, so as you said, about uh, resource optimization in the context of coherently controlled quantum computation. This is a joint work with uh, Alexandre Clément, uh, and, uh, who is going to present this work at uh, MFCS uh, this summer. Okay, so the context is, uh, is a coherent control uh, of quantum, uh, in quantum computing. So the idea is to go beyond uh, quantum circuits. So I think yesterday you, you already heard about this kind of thing, so I can go quickly to this uh, motivating uh, slide. But uh, essentially the idea is that when we have a quantum circuit, we definitely have quantum data. We have qubits which can be in superpositions and so on. But if you look at the way the computation is organized, the flow of information, the transformations you are applying, it's essentially classical. So it's either fixed or you may have some classical control, but it's, uh, it's essentially classical. The idea of coherent control is to go beyond this and allow uh, to have quantum primitives which are applied depending on some quantum states in superpositions, if you like. Okay? Um, so a good example, a famous example for this is the quantum switch where you have two uh, quantum operations, so two unitary transformations, U and V, and you want to decide in which order you apply these two quantum operations depending on the uh, quantum state. So here it's, uh, it's an informal description, so it's going to be uh, formal in a few slides, but here it's informal. So the idea is that you have these two transformations and we use uh, so this uh, optical, uh, optic, uh, so the PBS in order to represent this. So which means that depending on the polarization of your particle here, you are going to be reflected or transmitted. So if you are reflected, you apply U and then you apply V. And if you are transmitted, you apply V and then U. Okay, so we see that the order depends on the polarization. And now if you have a superposition of the two polarization, you get this superposition of the two possible order of the gates. Okay, so it's a way to implement this kind of uh, coherent control. So why is it interesting to consider coherent control? Well, uh, it turns out that we have a computational advantage with coherent control, which can be uh, described in terms of uh, complexity in the query model. Uh, so for instance, say if we consider this particular problem, so the commuting problem, so the input is uh, two unitaries, U and V, acting on the same space, same number of qubits. Um, and the promise is that they are either commuting or anti-commuting, so which can be uh, summed up as follows. So uv is minus 1 to the k uh, vu. And the objective is to find the k, so to decide whether they are commuting or anti-commuting. And uh, in order to solve this problem, uh, it turns out that if you use quantum circuits, you need at least three queries to uh, u and v. So in total, okay? So for instance, here you have a circuit with two queries to V and one query to U. And this circuit is optimal, okay? There is no quantum circuit with uh, just two queries, for instance. Uh, but it turns out that if you allow coherent control, and in particular, if you allow this uh, quantum switch, you can do it in uh, just uh, two queries. And the idea is that you, you, you prepare this superposition of vertical and horizontal polarization in such a way that here you are applying a superposition of u before v and v before u. And uh, due to some uh, interferences, at the end of the day here, at the, in the output, if you measure in the diagonal basis, you are going to have the, the answer, uh, they are commuting or not. Okay, so this is an interesting uh, separation between quantum circuits and coherent control. And you can generalize it using uh, uh, the so-called um, Fourier promise problem where you have uh, n unitary transformations and in this case you have a separation which is a uh, square root of n or log n depending on how you define the problem actually but there is a, you can you can extend it and get, have a separation between the two okay so um so we have this separation, so it's, uh, it's interesting to look at coherent control in particular in order to optimize uh, the, this kind, to solve this kind of problems with a query in the query model. And, um, and the goal here uh, for this talk is not to describe a new problem or something like that, but it's more to find a way to optimize resources. 
That is, uh, if you give me uh, the description of uh, an algorithm in, uh, based on coherent control, is it possible to take this, uh, this circuit, this description, and optimize it in order to minimize the number of queries? So this is the objective of the talk, minimizing the number of queries to, uh, to, to the, the oracles, and uh, possibly in an automatic way. Okay? It's similar to optimizing the, the number of T gates, for instance, in a circuit, but here we want to optimize the number of uh, oracle uh, queries. Okay, so to do this, we need, uh, we need a way to describe coherently controlled quantum computations. So we have the PBS calculus, which is actually the language I'm, I'm using uh, in the previous uh, slides, and I'm going to use after this. But actually, there are other languages. And uh, maybe in, uh, in the audience here, there are lots of people who, who uh, are participating to the development of these languages. And this is not uh, a full description of all the possible uh, languages. Okay, it's just a few examples. So you can use, for instance, the rooted quantum circuits. So I think, uh, Gustav, you talked about this uh, yesterday. Uh, I missed your talk, sorry about that. Um, yeah. Uh, you can use also this kind of quantum circuits. So this one is uh, developed in Oxford. So if you go to uh, Grenoble, you may see uh, this kind of uh, quantum circuits, generalization of quantum circuits. So Julian Vex is here, I think. Alester is there, okay. Uh, Cyril Brontia is also working on these kind of things. And uh, if you prefer to go south of Paris, you, you will see uh, these kind of uh, addressable quantum gates in Saclay. Okay? And all these formalisms are, can be used to describe coherent control or indefinite order of quantum, uh, quantum of um, causal uh, structures. Right. Anyway, so you have these, uh, these uh, several uh, possible languages for uh, representing coherent control. And so here I'm going to use the PBS calculus. And um, the reason is that it's, um, it's, uh, it's adapted for this particular problem. So first of all, it's a graphical language. So it's a prop in terms of a category. So just like a ZX, a quantum circuit, or the love calculus, which is also a prop. Um, and in particular, there is no side information. And uh, so it means that when you have the description of the diagram, you have all the information. And this is important if you want to optimize the computation. You, you want to have all the information at once. And here, this is the case. You have all the information here. Uh, it turns out that this language is equipped with an equational theory. So you can transform the diagrams. And this is exactly what we want to do in order to optimize the diagram. It's uh, also oracle ready. You can represent uh, queries, okay, just by putting a U and V, like this. So it's inspired by optics, means that it's uh, maybe more intuitive than other languages, maybe. And uh, it's uh, another interesting property: it's that it's valid by construction. So if you draw a diagram like this, it represents a valid quantum evolution. Excuse me. Could you move your mobile phone away from the microphone? Sure. Um, okay, so it's valid by construction. If you draw something like this, it, it represents a unitary evolution. Okay, so uh, here is the definition of the language. So we have few primitives. So the polarizing beam splitter here, uh, gates, which are labeled by uh, just a unitary, uh, just by names representing unitary evolutions. We have a negation, which is uh, acting on the polarization. So it's the same negation as in the love calculus that we have seen previously. So it flips the polarization of the particle. And then we have the identity and the swap. And uh, we can do composition, so sequential composition. The parallel composition is, uh, is not a tensor product. It's a direct sum, again. And we have the trace. Okay, we can take an input and uh, put it, uh, take an output, sorry, and connect it to an input. Uh, so here are a few examples. So again, the quantum switch, but we can draw uh, more complicated examples. Okay. Um, okay. So it's a prop, as I said previously. So it means that you can deform the diagrams uh, without changing the semantics. So actually, the, the semantics is, uh, is the following. So we can define uh, a path semantics, which is describing how a particle uh, it can go through uh, uh, such a, a diagram. 
So for instance, if we start here with the vertical polarization, so represented in red in this, uh, in this picture, and the zero means that we are in the wire number zero. So if we start from here with this polarization, so we go through the first unitary transformation, so we apply U1, then uh, we are reflected, so we are here, we apply U2, U3, reflected again, so we reach the output. Okay? And so the output is number zero and the polarization is vertical. So we represent this, this particular evolution like this. So we can start with uh, a polarization which is horizontal now in blue, in position two, so in this wire. Now we are transmitted, the negation is changing the polarization, reflected, so U3, U2, reflected again, U1, we change the polarization and we reach the output. Okay? A third example, so now we start here, but uh, on, the second, on the wire number two, but with this vertical polarization, and we do something like this. We use the trace, the feedback loop, and finally we reach this, this output. Okay? So this is the description of the action for some particular inputs. Uh, you can make it formal. Okay? Please don't read this part. Uh, you can uh, even do a denotational semantics. So the important point is that the two semantics are equivalent. There is an adequacy between the two. Okay. Okay. So um, so we can define formally the semantics of this. So if I go back to to my example here, so I give you all the possible evolutions. So the six possible evolutions because there are two possible uh, polarization and three possible uh, inputs here for the wire. And uh, if we look carefully at the action of this, uh, of this diagram, we can see that in uh, all the cases, we apply the three unitary evolutions, U1, U2, U3, in a different order. So actually, this is a way to apply a, a, a controlled permutation of these three unitary transformations. Um, okay, which was maybe not obvious at first, uh, at first sight. Okay, but uh, to do such a controlled uh, permutation of three unitaries, maybe we can use this diagram, which is uh, maybe uh, nicer, and which is actually implementing exactly the same, uh, the same transformation. So these two diagrams are equivalent. Okay, so uh, here we have two examples. We have an example of two diagrams uh, representing the same evolution. So is it possible to transform one into the other? And the answer is yes, because we have an equational theory which is, uh, which is complete. Uh, so, we don't really need to look at the, 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 these rules, it's just to illustrate the fact that we have this equational theory which is uh, sound, so it preserves the semantics, which is complete, so it means that if you take two diagrams representing the same evolution, you can go from one to the other using these rules. And it's also minimal, which means that uh, you actually need all these equations. If you remove one equation, you lose the completeness. Okay, so that's, that's the, the PBS uh, calculus, so equipped with this uh, equational theory, so that's a good point. But here we want to use this language in order to do uh, resource optimization. And uh, it turns out that, um, that we need a little bit more because this language is actually uh, not very uh, resource sensitive. Uh, so, Let's take this, this example. In this example, if we look carefully, we can see that uh, the particle will never use the feedback loop because if it's uh, reflected, then we go uh, through U and to the output, and if it's transmitted, we also go to the output. We never use the loop. So it's tempting to just uh, remove this loop and uh, draw these kind of pictures. Okay? Because this loop somehow is uh, somehow a, a dead code, right? And so we want to remove it. Uh, okay, but if we do this, so we are outside the, the standard uh, PBS calculus, and uh, we want to use here unsaturated uh, polarizing beam splitters with uh, three legs instead of uh, four. So it's nice, but, um, but the problem is that um, you may have some problems. So for instance, if you compose this, uh, this uh, unsaturated beam splitter with this one, you get something like this. And uh, here there is a problem, because if you have, for instance, uh, vertical polarization, you are reflected, and then you are reflected again, but there is no wire here. 
Okay, so we are losing this uh, valid by construction property here. Um, okay, but there is actually a simple solution for this, uh, which is to use a, a typing discipline. Here, if you look at, at this, this PBS, you can see that if you are here, uh, since you, you are coming from this wire, you must, be, uh, you must have a vertical polarization. Okay? So if you are here, you have a vertical polarization. If you are here, you have an horizontal polarization. So you can keep this information in order to have um, a kind of typing system, which is described here in order to have valid by construction uh, diagrams. So, yeah. so here the idea is that we use uh, different colors, um, blue for horizontal, red for vertical, and black means that we, are, we can be both vertical or horizontal. And, uh, and then we, we, we have what, we, uh, what is called a color prop, and we can, we can draw uh, diagrams like this. So that's not a big problem, okay? So we can use these unsaturated diagrams. If we are in the color prop formalism, it, it works perfectly. Okay, so we have a new language. So we need a new axiomatization, a new uh, equational theories. So here it's, uh, the idea is to, to give new rules, not just to add rules to the language, okay? We just forget, we can just forget the previous ones and consider these ones. So, uh, I will not go to too much details, but what is interesting is that if you look at the last column, you can see just as a, as a way to decompose saturated beam splitters, so beam splitters with uh, four legs, you can actually decompose them into a beam splitter with three legs. You can always decompose them. And once you have done this decomposition, you can uh, focus on this part of the, the first two columns. Uh, which are considering just uh, unsaturated beam splitters uh, with basic properties like uh, commutation properties and uh, inverse and so on. So we have this, uh, this fairly simple axiomatization for the language. And the good news is that it's, uh, it's complete. Uh, so to show this, we, we introduce some normal forms. Uh, like this. So the idea is that we have several layers. Uh, so the first layer is a layer of PBS, which are used to decompose black wires into red and blue wires. Okay, in such a way that after this, uh, this, uh, this first layer, we, only we don't have any uh, black wire. Then there is a layer of uh, unitary evolutions, a layer of negations or, or nothing, then some permutation of wires, and finally we recombine some colored wires into black wires if we need. So this is the normal form, and the good news is that we can transform any diagram into a diagram in normal form, and moreover it's efficient, okay? It's a polynomial in the, in the size of the, of the diagram. So for instance, if we start with this, this diagram, uh, we get this one. Okay, which is in normal form. And once we have the normal form, we can prove the, the completeness of the, the equational theory. Okay, so now what is interesting with this one is that uh, actually the normal form, an interesting property of the normal form is that uh, there is no uh, dead code in the normal form. If we look at the initial diagram, there is a V here, which is applied. And we can see that in the normal form, there is no V because this V is useless. We never go through the V. And the normal form is able to detect this and remove the V. So we remove all the dead code when we consider uh, the normal form. So which is reducing the number of uh, queries to the Oracle. Okay, so normal form is, is good, um, but actually it's not, it's not optimal in terms of uh, number of queries because here we see that we have an occurrence of u here, an occurrence of u here, and we can actually simplify them and merge them in such a way to have just one call to u. This is this idea. This is if we have a blue u and a red u, 
we can use these, these kind of transformations in such a way that we have just one instance of U, reducing the number of queries. Uh, so we can combine the, the normal form procedure with this simple idea and we get what we call the query optimization procedure, so which is efficient. And the good news is that uh, now if we start from this normal form, we apply this rule, we get something like this. And this one is optimal in number of queries. And we can prove it for any diagram. So if you start from a diagram, uh, you put it in normal form, and then you apply this simple idea of grouping uh, the queries when, we, when you can, you get a, a diagram which is optimal in number of queries. So we can do this. We can reach the optimal diagram efficiently. Um, OK, so maybe two comments about this. So the first comment is that actually we are optimizing each uh, unitary independently. So this one is actually the one which is optimal for U and, uh, so, and also for W independently. So, which is not obvious because if you look at the, the, uh, the quantum circuit we have seen before for implementing the commuting problem, in the quantum circuit there was two occurrences of U and one occurrence of V or the other way around. Uh, but you cannot optimize the number of queries of both U and V in the same circuit. Here it's possible to, to optimize all the gates independently and get a circuit which is optimal for all the gates. So that's the first comment. The second comment is that, okay, so this circuit is optimal in number of queries, but clearly it's not optimal in number of polarizing beam splitters. Because uh, here we have two beam splitters that we can uh, actually simplify. Okay, they are useless, these two uh, polarizing beam splitters. So that's why we can consider this uh, refined problem where we want to optimize the number of queries, but also the number of polarizing beam splitters in this uh, lexicographic order. And in order to do that, uh, we can actually use a, another procedure, which is called PGT, which is also an efficient procedure. So the idea is that you take your diagram and you write your diagram in this, in this form, so where here you put all the unitaries in parallel like this with a trace. And in this P you have all the polarizing beam splitters and uh, negations and so on. And it turns out that this P you can put it in, in, an, in a form like this, where in sigma 1 and sigma 2 you just have rewiring. And C1s and C2 or CK are just um, basic uh, transformation made of polarizing beam splitters. So you can put your diagram in this form, and once your diagram is in this form, uh, you are reducing the number of beam splitters. So for instance, if you take the previous example, using this uh, PGT normal form procedure, so we will remove these two uh, uh, beam splitters. But we, we, it's even uh, more interesting because we, actually we only have one polarizing beam splitter at the end of the process. Okay, it's possible to write it just using one PBS. Um, okay, so this procedure is, uh, is optimal uh, in certain, uh, if you have some hypotheses. Uh, so if you apply the PGT form, then you get something which is query PBS optimal if, if uh, all the queries are used at most once in the diagram. Okay, if you have one copy of each uh, query in, uh, in the, the initial diagram, then you get something which is optimal. Okay. And in the general case, actually, the problem is, uh, we show that the problem is NP-hard. Okay? So we cannot expect to have an efficient procedure uh, for the general case. Um, okay, and the proof is based on a reduction from uh, a graph problem, the maximum Eulerian cycle decomposition. Okay, so to sum up, um, so we consider the, this problem of resource optimization. So in order to uh, address this problem, we have introduced a, a variant of the PBS calculus, uh, which is more resource sensitive with this uh, unsaturated PBS. Uh, we have shown the, the completeness and minimality of the, the axiomatization. And uh, we have now an efficient procedure for minimizing the number of queries. And if you want to minimize both the number of queries and the PBS, 
You have an efficient procedure in some cases, but the problem is hard in general. Um, so future work, um, we want to have an experimental evaluation of the heuristic. So maybe it's uh, ambiguous, this one. By experimental here, I mean uh, from a computer science point of view. Okay, so it's a used benchmark uh, to see how good is the heuristic when you are not in this, uh, in this case. Okay, when you are in the general case, how good is the heuristic? So uh, the problem is that uh, we don't really have a data set for this. So we can test it for a random, uh, randomly generated diagrams, for instance. Uh, another uh, point that we want to work on is to define a more expressive language. Because here we only use polarizing beam splitters and negation, but it, it, it would be interesting to, to have a language uh, a more expressive language for the, the, the quantum control. So, for instance, by adding new generators from the love calculus, like, uh, like beam splitters, non-polarizing beam splitters, uh, phase shifter, and so on. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Simon. Uh, okay, lots of lots of questions. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, in the normal form that you uh, arrive at before you reduce the number of beam splitters, how do I see uh, that you need coherent control there? Um, okay, so okay, that's a good point. So. Here, the coherent control comes from the fact that uh, your input can be in superposition. So you can have superposition of polarization, you can have superposition of positions. So your particle can be in superposition of here and there, for instance. But uh, if you start with a classical uh, configuration, a classical input, then it remains classical in, uh, in this uh, description. This is, uh, yeah. So this is sufficient for solving this uh, commuting uh, problem, for instance, or even uh, also, it's a generalization, but this is also why we want to consider generalization of this. So this was the last point in my conclusion. So to, to, to have a more expressive language, because if you add in the language uh, uh, a beam splitter, non-polarizing beam splitter, in this case, you will be able to create superposition within uh, the diagram. Can, can you maybe uh, comment on the observation from quantum machine learning that coherent control is helpful only if you have tasks which involve memory? Which are what? Can you repeat this? From, from quantum machine learning, there is the observation that uh, coherent control is helpful only if you have a learning task that requires memory. And I wonder, because you started with an example of usefulness of coherent control, whether you can comment on this or relate to uh, this? I don't know, no, no. Maybe we can talk about this, but I don't know the context, so. No. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you for the talk. So when earlier, uh, when the love calculus was introduced, I remember um, Nicholas give H0, P0, H1, P1, given different polarization of the wave plate. And I wonder if choosing different polarization of wave plate as a computational basis would help find the best heuristic or a relatively good heuristic to optimize both the PBS and the number of queries that you use. Or it doesn't matter, like choosing. Uh, you mean changing the definition of the, of the PBS? Uh, or? Changing the definition of H and B. Because uh, I assume previously you're just using the horizontal and vertical. Yes. Yeah. Polarization, but what if you use a different uh, uh, polarization wave plate? Is there still acting as a con computational basis? Um, so again, this is something that we want to, to look at to have a more uh, general transformation on the polarization. Um, uh, at the moment, I don't know if you just uh, no, I don't know. Okay, sorry, I have another question. Uh, so yesterday, during the poster session, um, Benoit, uh, Benoit gave a poster about this multi-world calculus. And I wonder, because when you use different colors to demonstrate this 
diagram, it reminds me of how they present their poster. So I wonder if there is any connection between this, this PBS calculus and the multi-world universe cal uh, multi calculus. Y yes, I think there is. Um, so we talked about this uh, already. Um, so yes, so here really the, the idea of the PBS is to uh, split uh, uh, the, the system into subsystems, in you know, a direct sum of subsystems, if you like, uh, of cases. Um, so, um, so we already looked at this, but it's not it's not a, a direct translation. Okay, so there are some similarities, but it's not uh, it's not exactly the same things. Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, one of the motivations for this coherent control is the separation uh, between coherently controlled and non-coherently controlled, right? And there's a gap yes. in some problems, for example, for the N switch. So I was wondering if, if, if this calculus that decreases the query complexity in the coherent control, can you apply it to some examples, like known constructions which have a gap and increase the gap? Okay, so definitely the idea is to apply this uh, to, to, to these kind of examples. Uh, that's interesting. I'm not sure that you can amplify the gap like this, because here really the idea is that you get, uh, you get your, your description of the coherently controlled algorithm and you optimize it. So you can decrease the complexity of uh, it. So, okay, so potentially it's possible, but in general, in the example I know it's uh, it's um, okay, maybe not necessarily. So if if it's clear that it's optimal, if it's clear that uh, the, the coherently controlled uh, quantum computation is optimal, then it's useless to do this. But if it's not, then yeah, it, it makes sense to do this. Yeah. Questions? Okay. Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, Clarification, first of all, the, the unit trees are just a free monoid over some, some names, yes, right? Exactly. Nothing going on there at all. Yes. Okay, and so if you're going to do the, the extension you mentioned of bringing in the elements from the, the love calculus, would you then put that, but then would that then replace the unit trees or you'd keep ah, them? Okay, so that's two different, uh, different directions. Uh, here uh, I was, um, the idea is that uh, all these uh, unitaries, uh, these oracles, are acting on another register. So you assume that you have a particle with a polarization and also another data register. And uh, the gates are acting on the data register and uh, the, the PBS is acting on the polarization. If you add some more uh, primitives, they are also acting on the polarization and the position, okay? but not on the data register. That's two separated things. And another perspective is to uh, look inside the boxes and see uh, if you put a, a ZX diagram which is uh, describing what is inside the box, for instance. Uh, can you see how, how these two words are interacting? Okay, how the PBS and the ZX inside the box can interact, if it's possible. I don't know. One more thing. Um, if you did do the extension by adding the new primitives, mm -hmm. do you still have your red and blue type system or does that have to go away? Uh, it's uh, um, yes, you can, but you are going to lose uh, lots of information because uh, when you you arrive with uh, with blue, then you are going to be black because you are losing the information. Okay, you are not in this basis anymore. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Out of curiosity, have you dissected the black boxness, black spot, the black boxness, and so like even uh, other models in the Kiwi model, for instance, say in Love Calculus or any, if you could rewrite the actual contents of the box, let's say in this example, uh, if you could rewrite W as U with some X a little bit more gates after, or U as W with a few more gates after, then you could uh, do even better. Okay, yes. So here really the idea is that we have no information about U and V. It's an oracle, uh, an oracle model. If you have some extra information, then you can definitely use it. Uh, if you can decompose W into U and something, then you can do it and then merge the two 
So here maybe merge the two copies that you get. So if you have extra information, you can do some extra optimization. Yeah. Yeah. So is there some arbitrariness in how you, uh, let's say that if you are outside of the query model or you know that there's some information about your boxes or you can have some freedom in whichever sub parts of your circuit you choose to draw your U box around. Um, uh, how, does, how does this uh, work with say, uh, your future work mentioned experimental metrics? Um, okay. so. It, so I'm not sure to understand, but uh, so the, the idea is that in the Oracle model, it's really part of the problem. What what is the Oracle and what is the gate and uh, how do you optimize it? Uh, but then, okay, so here it's, uh, so you can use the same language uh, using uh, matrices here inside, okay? Not necessarily Oracle, and uh, that is a unitary transformation for which you have some information. And in this uh, case, uh, you, you are just going to multiply the matrices and so on. So if you know the information, if you know what is the unitary, just put the description of the unitary and, uh, and use this description. So for instance, you can put circuits. You can, can put quantum circuits. And in this case, here, it's going to be the composition of the two quantum circuits. Okay? So you, you, you can do these kind of things. Yeah. And then in practice, in practice and experimentally, what kind of metrics are people interested in the near optical quantum computing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I prefer to say I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Uh, so in this uh, normalization procedure, uh, it looks like you're removing all the feedback loops. Yes. Uh, okay. So, um, so for instance, the quantum switch removes completely. Uh, you get rid of a feedback loop in the quantum switch. It unfolds. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's all uh, what I wanted to, to ask. Yes, yes. So if you take the quantum switch, okay, that's an interesting example. So in this, in this part, you, you get rid of the, of the loop. But uh, uh, again, here, you also get rid of the loop. But at some point, if you want to, uh, here you will, uh, ah, at some point, you, the loop will come back in at the end of the, of the process. So does this removing loops unfold the diagram so maybe it creates new uh, U's and V's? Uh, yes. Okay. Boxes? So okay, I should say that actually it's uh, here that you are creating loops. Maybe it's hidden, but here you are merging uh, gates um, with the same label. And the point is that if the gates are not in the same, uh, the same not in parallel, if they are uh, uh, sequential composition, if you like, you can still merge them. And in this case, when, when you merge them, you create a loop in order to make it work. So this is where the, the loop of the quantum switch is coming back, actually. Yes. Um, I also have a question about the optimizing the PVS um, use. So uh, could you... Uh, so could you perhaps go to this next slide? Like, I did, because I think I didn't get exactly how you're op optimizing it. It's sort of this normal form is the optimal form. That's kind of the theorem or? Uh, so it's, this normal form here uh, is optimal uh, in terms of number of queries and PBS. So in the lexicographic order, in this order. And in, if you have the, the property that each, uh, each oracle is used once. And only once. Okay. So in this case, it's optimal, yes. And, uh, do you know a simple example uh, where, where you actually uh, use more than two queries? Because it seems like you have a lot of powerful tools that actually allow you to reduce the number of qu queries quite a lot. Yes. So for instance, the example I gave before about uh, this one. So this one here uh, for the implementation of this uh, uh, this uh, permutation of three unitaries, you can see that uh, you have three copies of U1, okay, and three copies of each. Thanks. Um, maybe I'll just ask a final question. Um, so when you talk about number of queries, is maybe you said this already, is it just literally the amount of times that a box appears in the yes. picture? So, so, so loops don't, I don't need to count Loops, no. really. I don't. I don't count them many, many times or anything no. like this. So, okay. Yeah. 
Um, all right, let's uh, thank Simon again. Yep.